today, Ken. First of all, let me thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I've uh, seen the other videos. I'm considered an honor to be a part of your series. So thank you, guys. Well, you're most welcome. For our audience, could you please uh, introduce yourself and uh, give us a little bit about uh, your background? Sure. Uh, I'm Ken Yates. I go by Ken instead of Kenneth. Um, I uh, am a professor of clinical education at the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. And uh, uh, I, uh, if you want to know my background as uh, going all the way back a little bit. Uh, well, let, let's start off with, uh, so where were you born and where did you grow up? Oh, that background. Okay, yeah, great. We <laughs> uh, you went, okay. I grew up, uh, I was born in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, outside Washington, the Silver Spring, Maryland, and uh, grew up in, in Silver Spring. Uh, my uh, early uh, days um, saw me as uh, going to school in that area and then going to college at the University of Maryland where I majored in humanities and also in education. So I uh, graduated at U University of Maryland as a teacher in secondary school, in the middle, what we in California would call middle school and high school education. And um, I was also very active in hobbies, including music and media and things like that. So what's had an influence on my, has had an influence my whole life. So, so where did you go after you, after you graduated from college? Uh, after I graduated from college, I taught uh, a little bit at, in Washington, D.C., which was a wonderful um, experience for me. And then I moved to California. Uh, in California, um, I did some teaching in California here in Los Angeles area. And uh, the teaching market was such that, um, uh, <laughs> that I was easily wooed away from it because of the long distances I had to travel to teach. I was easily wooed away from that uh, by a friend of mine who really turned out to be a mentor of mine and said, you know, you really bring out the best in people. <laughs> why, don't you why don't you join my business in, uh, in investments in real estate? And so I actually left the teaching profession and uh, started a business profession as a young adult yes so how long did you do that so you were in real estate uh, did you <laughs> show houses and or commercial things or what no it was it was mostly uh, real estate uh, development and ah. uh, real estate uh, management which mean, meant a lot of interaction with uh, managers and uh, people put the public you know and uh that that actually transformed me into a person who says, wait a minute, I'm, I'm pretty good at this business, you know, of business. Um, and so I actually uh, went from real estate uh, investments into other kinds of businesses with an investment company. And that took me in several different directions, um, including um, all kinds of uh, media and entertainment businesses. Uh, and ultimately, I focused in on technology and media because I'd always used technology in the investment world as a way of capturing, analyzing, and delivering data. You know, my first computer is as big as your desk in the background and <laughs> I did little flip-flops back and forth. And so I was always interested in how technology could improve in a sense, improved that we now know as human performance. And um, so this is a thread that went through all these businesses and media and entertainment and eventually became um, uh, solely uh, an area of focusing on the technology side and then ended up with being asked by the State Department to do some work in international development. Uh, and that international development led me to set up distance learning networks um, and also working on projects, what they call rule of law projects, where we um, put all the laws of various countries on the internet 
and created databases to do finding tools and and uh, things like that. So I was um, uh, ended up in basically a late career doing international development work. We using technology and all the things I had learned along the way on what I now know is human performance. And the one thing that I took away from all of that experience as an entrepreneur, as a businessman for 50 years, um, uh, was that the principles that we now know as human performance principles actually work. They work, <laughs> okay? And they work internationally, they work across cultures, they work. When you improve people's confidence and self-efficacy, they perform better and wanna take on more challenging uh, tasks and things like that, they all work. And that's was my big takeaway from virtually my whole adult life, the career as an entrepreneur and uh, as a, in business. Um, and just to segue, that led me uh, in the international development work to uh, when the professors who were teaching law in this distance learning network between Indonesia and the United States that I was working on, they said to me, well, now that we're going to be teaching, you know, using um, video conferencing in those days and ISDN lines and things like that and video servers, tell us how to do that. And I realized that I needed to go back to school. So, <laughs> and so I entered, I went to USC and entered into their programs. And, and in the doctoral program, I met Dick Clark, uh, who immediately says, you do some really interesting work internationally. And I said, and um, so that's where I got to know Dick. But the uh, going back to school at a, actually a late age, um, I was a non-traditional student and brought a wealth of all kinds of business experiences to a school of education. Uh, the professors enjoyed it, my classmates enjoyed it, and um, I learned basically updating all of my knowledge. Lifelong learning is one of my big, my big interests. So let me pause there, go ahead. <laughs> well, so so uh, you're, you're, you're now a professor at USC, so how did that come about? You were a student? And and was there anything in between or did you just segue right into that? Uh, actually, uh, I went into the doctoral program and uh, almost immediately upon entering the doctoral program is when Dick and I started working together because he had projects he was working on. Um, we, uh, he, he had uh, the desire to create a center. And so we came up with the Center for Cognitive Technology where technology meant both uh, information communications technology and a systematic and systemic way of looking at solving problems. And uh, so that is basically where I met Dick Clark and we, we entered into that. Now, during that program, as soon as I finished my doctorate degree, Dick says, you need to be teaching in this program and you need to be teaching in the class that we teach the uh, Dick's version of uh, human performance technology called gap analysis and uh, using the book, turning research into results, which was a textbook at the time in these classes. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, Dick knew that and he says, you need to be teaching it now that you have a doctorate. So I started teaching and continuing my research with Dick at the Center for Cognitive Technology. Uh, and then um, eventually became a, um, a director of evaluation for the school's accreditation, an associate dean for professional development, and, uh, and now a full professor in clinical education. And I still teach learning and motivation, instructional design, and uh, human performance technology, which I found to have an actual term of what I was doing in life <laughs> as bringing out the best of people and using things that I learned as a school teacher. Is I learned from Dick that it's yes, this is called human performance technology. <laughs> okay, yeah. and um, it was a, a one been a wonderful experience. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for providing us with that background. So your first now human performance technology is known by many different names. I mean, it's been called performance technology, performance improvement, human performance improvement, and HPT, human performance technology, which is the the title that I've used for this video series. But uh, so for our audience, which I think includes a lot of people coming into the field and that, can you share with us 
you know, what your first exposure to that was and um, who was, who were some of your early influences, people or books or articles back in the early days when you first started? Can you share that with us? Sure. In those early days, um, it, this, it was sort of a, uh, what you might call an awakening, if you will, <laughs> because I was first introduced to uh, Dick's book uh, with Fred Estes, The Turning Research into Results, mm -hmm. uh, as a class. And everything that I was reading in that book, because it was business oriented, uh, and we were, uh, our classes were adapting it to educational settings, yes. But I actually resonated with the business orientation of Dick's work. And, um, uh, uh, and you know, in the book, it, in the classes, in the book, um, it, it has this popular name called gap analysis, right? And I think it was the fact that I enjoyed that so much. It was such a straightforward framework of problem solving in any organization and actually in any person, an individual problem solving of breaking things down into uh, or turning problems into goals, actually restating problems into goals and then asking, okay, what is the knowledge, motivation, and organizational factors that influence achieving that goal? That is, that was amazing to me, and um, it was things that I had done in pieces along my career of all of my different businesses, going back to those early early days, and it, it built on what I knew as a school teacher in secondary school. But I never knew, saw how it was formulated or um, in such an organized way until I was actually a part of that class and, and then got to know uh, Dick Clark. The, and that KMO, what we call KMO framework of the app analysis is um, something that then I became very, very enthused about. And then I started obviously looking around, okay, what is this part of, and talking to Dick, and what is this part of, some part of a broader movement than looking on the ISPI website, same thing. It says, hey, this is something that actually is bigger than just um, what I'm learning in class. And I think what that did to, for me, was to help solidify this as a simple but elegant framework that I could turn around and teach my students as one way of problem solving, yes, there's probably all kinds of other ways of problem solving. And I keep telling the students, uh, you could go and Google gap analysis, you'll come up with millions of returns and there's all kinds. And you know, some people would say, well, gap analysis sounds like a deficit because there's a gap. And I say, yes, you could look at it that way, but you, what you're really doing is, is something that's very natural. We all want to go from point A to point B in life. Okay. So you can call anything in the middle what you want to call it. <laughs> and, but it's, it's, uh, the framework is still simple and elegant. What do you need to know to get there? What's going to motivate you to get there? And what kind of resources and, uh, and setting and environment and culture uh, is going to help you get there? And those, mm -hmm. if you can walk away with knowing how to do that kind of problem solving and that elegant framework, then we have taught you something at uh, USC Rossi. <laughs> okay. And the good part about this is that students come back to me today and say, wow, it works. And students, even while they're taking classes, will go and I say, just try it. Try it. Go Monday morning. Go ahead. Go try it. Do it. Look at a problem this way. You know, you get pulled into a meeting. And everybody's talking about a problem and everybody's talking about, well, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do that. Try to, I said, just try one thing. Ask them one question and they'll stop the room. And that question is, okay, let's everybody pause for a moment. If this problem were solved, what goal would be achieved? And that's where everything goes quiet. So if people can which sometimes takes a struggle, decide on a goal, and then you can ask the magic three questions. Well, what do we need to know? What motivates us? And what's the resources we need to get to that goal? And when students come back to me and say, wow, Dr. Gates, it works, this works, this works. I said, great, that's your takeaway. You can, there's all kinds of other things you're gonna learn, 
but if there's one thing about solving problems you can take away from this okay that's a long-winded answer isn't it but oh, that, I, I love it, I love it. <laughs> but it was really um uh, uh dick's work uh in in the early days of um in the early yeah. days of, of of my uh uh, graduate doctoral work that led me into this, which then turned me, obviously you can see how enthused I am about this because of the feedback I get from people who actually use the system. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and that's, I guess, the biggest influence. Of course, along the way, the things that I started teaching when um, was uh, not only the learning motivation classes, which we taught the gap analysis in, but also uh, instructional design classes and the work I was doing with Dick had uh, greatly influenced by cognitive scientists like John Anderson, um, and obviously the great learning scientists, people you've had in your series, you know, Paul Kirshner, John Sweller. These were all the people that we studied, Rich Mayer, multimedia, and worked with. We studied and worked with them, and um, they obviously had a tremendous influence as well. Uh, their work on who I am and what I teach today and what I guide students in today. So, well, thank you uh, for that. Yeah, that book with uh, Fred Estes. I've got that in the in the on the bookshelf in the back there someplace. It's a it is a classic. I, I I'm sad to say that it's not signed. Every time I've had a chance to see Dick face to face, I forget to take that book. <laughs> And I go home and I'm, on the way home, I'm thinking, oh, what a lost opportunity here on that. <laughs> um, let me shift gears here slightly. Um, but I do want to, uh, we will talk a little bit because I want to get into cognitive task analysis. I know you work with on that a lot here. But, but before we get into that, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you do, and I usually set this by saying you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor there and they ask you, you know, Ken, what do you do? What, what is your, you know, simplistic elevator speech, you know, one floor, maybe two, um, and, and how you position that? What is it that you do? What is your elevator speech? Okay, well, I'm, a, yeah, I'm an educational psychologist uh, who uh, teaches learning and motivation. Uh, to uh, doctoral and master's level students at the uh, Rossier School of Education at USC. Um, I also teach instructional design uh, and I guide doctoral dissertations. I guide students on, a, on doctoral dissertations in one of two areas. One is a curriculum design dissertations where they take a topic and actually develop a curriculum with evidence-based practices and principles. Um, or in human performance technology using the gap analysis framework. And so I have many students um, who are, are all working on various stages of their dissertations of doing conducting studies in human performance. And I also conduct research in um, uh, educational psychology, but mostly the intersections of educational psychology, human performance and technology. So I have a center, uh, a joint center with a Viterbi School of Engineering. And uh, at our center, it's called Chariot in keeping with our USC theme. <laughs> and it's called <laughs> the Center for Human Applied Reasoning and the Internet of Things. That's uh, the acronym is uh, Chariot, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so Chariot is involved in two areas of research. One is uh, how to use, uh, how to make use of physiological sensor data or the internet of things, wearables, if you will, to improve human performance. And also to investigate and examine and research how we can break the bottleneck of cognitive task analysis, break the bottleneck of eliciting expertise from others um, by using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So those are two areas of my research through the Chariot Center. Very interesting. So the uh, Internet of Things. When you so you use the word technology, but and I learned that basically technology wasn't computers, uh, software, and hardware. It was the application of science. And but you're using it in both ways. You're using it to mean 
you know, evidence-based practices, but you're also <laughs> using it to mean, you know, the internet of things and all the, all the hardware, software, et cetera, that, that stands behind that. So, so the wearables, that's a very interesting uh, a topic. Uh, I had a newsletter back in the late nineties where I had uh, uh, Diane Gajewski's uh, son who was interested in all those kinds of things. He wrote a, a quarterly column for me for, I don't know, four or six times. And, uh, and it, he was focused on wearables and such. So what, what's the latest in wearables and how we might use that, take advantage of that in, uh, in improving human performance, or organizational performance? Well, uh, <clears throat> as we know, uh, you know, the popularity of uh, the Apple Watch and Fitbits and, uh, uh, and now that has, has really created a, uh, an industry of um, both expensive, uh, such as Apple, Apple watches and inexpensive um, wearable technology, or uh, basically, you know, the smartphone reduced down to a wearable. Um, but it's not just wearables on wrist. Wearables is a very, very broad category that can mean anything from um, something that might be embedded in your cap uh, that is collecting um, physiological data. Uh, it could actually, if you ask the major office furniture manufacturers, they're investigating and researching basically what kind of physiological data can you capture from sitting in a chair, you know? Um, so there is, wearables is a very, very broad category. For, for us, we're interested in the physiological sensors um, that can give us data uh, that we can interpret using machine learning and algorithms to usable data to, for uh, both your cognition and uh, your state of cognition and your affective state or state of emotions. So that cognitive affective state you are in currently can be, um, can be actually interpreted or given to you as a feedback or a feed forward system um, based on physiological sensors. And the sensors being, yes, heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, galvanic skin response, uh, the amount of moisture or the skin temperature and other physiological data that are all embedded in, into wearables. Um, and what we basically are conducting studies on is taking the, uh, these physiological data as people perform difficult tasks and seeing how that data changes and apply algorithms, machine learning algorithms to see whether or not we can predict uh, when compared to what we call ground truth of the tried and true educational psychology measures of your cognitive load and your emotional state whether we can predict it using, when you take away the pen and pencil measures, whether or not we can predict those states just using the interpretations of machine learning. And the, the ultimate is to be able to provide this back to you on your localized laptop or smartphone. And it serves as a feed forward system to say, hey, Ken, for example, you're going into an important interview with Guy Wallace. So you may, before you turn on recording, you may want to take a moment and be mindful and lower your affective filter here. And you may want to reduce all of the schoolwork that's looking at you with your students on the other computer screens and get that off the screens, reduce your cognitive load down. Because right now you're in the red zone of cognitive load and you're not yet in the green zone in your emotional state. So let's do something. So that's a feed forward system before an important event or undertaking a difficult task or complex problem. And this is obviously, since it's personalized to you with this physiological data, this applies across any domain. It, you know, whether or not you're getting ready to have a tennis game with a difficult opponent or a student trying to, for the first time, solve a quadratic equation or divide fractions by fractions. You know, so these are data that we can use to provide the readiness to engage in a task. And the more ready you can make yourself by interventions, then the more prepared you are to undertake a, a task. 
And that's what the whole wearable project is all about. That's the first part of it. There is that's that's part. excellent. I, I am fascinated by that. I want my I want my uh, smartwatch to uh, tell me when I'm suffering from cognitive overload <laughs> and take a break or or in a pilot test for courses, and the watches going off so that the developer designer can think, oh, well, we overloaded them. Uh, too much That's effort. right. And you can imagine a teacher uh, has a class and, you know, and all the students have their, their different wearables on, whatever, and this teacher's on their, and the laptop's sitting there looking at it like, a, like your automobile dashboard. What's my speedometer or cognitive mm -hmm. load? And what's my tachometer or the underlying RPMs going on? So one of them's the emotions, one of them are is the cognitive load, and you can sit there and see whether or not the class as a whole, or by clicking on one particular student, uh, groups of students, whether or not you can take your class and say, okay, you people are, are having a, an easy time of this. So I'm gonna give you a more challenging problem. You go work together down there, and I'm gonna go spend time with the students who are having difficulty um, the concepts behind dividing practice by practice or whatever. And you can apply this to any adult learning, obviously, anybody who has availability of a wearable to be able to do this. So this is the this is the ultimate vision. And we've actually done a little proof of concept or an exploratory study in which the predictability using these sensors is, you know, it reaches 90% or so. And uh, it's that's good information for a person uh, who can use it as a feedback or feed forward system, if you will, as they're engaging. Um, and it also prompts the, um, the ability to be able to say, you're struggling with a problem. Perhaps you could go back a couple steps to a, a process, a step where you successfully did this, worked on this problem. And now let's take a run at it again with some new information. Of course, and that kind of it prompts the second part of this is what information do you feed the person in their ear or on their laptop? And that information on any domain we want to capture with cognitive task analysis. So we have the content portion of it and we have the cognitive affective state portion of a learning cycle, if you will instructional cycle of feedback, closed feedback system, if you will. Well, is that is that a good segue then into CTA cognitive tasks? <laughs> sure. So Dick has told me that, because I've asked him before about this, um, and he's, I said, you know, is there a workshop? Well, he says, well, we've given workshops previously, but we don't have anything, you know, public workshops. And I know that you and he have worked on those things together. So, what can you share with us about, you know, what is cognitive task analysis and without, you know, drilling down and giving us the full class, you know, <laughs> what, what are, so there's major steps, but there are steps that are tricky and, but there's a process behind the whole thing. So can you give us kind of an overview of that process and talk about some of the more trickier aspects so that, you know, people don't uh, think, uh, it, you know, it's just a slam dunk. I can, you know, go do that uh, based on what I've heard here. Exactly. Sure. Sure. Um, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, Dick and I, uh, again, going back some years now, uh, when we first met, uh, when I started the doctoral program at USC, uh, and I was working in international development, Dick says, well, what do you do international? Well, I said, I, I actually, before I set up a database where you can access all the laws of Afghanistan, for, for example, or Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. etc., and access them over the internet, I have to go out and interview all the people who use the law. And I have to tease out from legal scholars, from lawyers, from judges and other people who on a daily basis actually use the corpus of law and, and governing documents of a country. And I have to ask them, how do you think about the law? How do you use it? How do you search? How do you explore? And I said, Dick, they have to, they have to tell me and I have to take all of this in and summarize it so that I can turn around and create a database that's not too complex. If you're in a developing country, people don't know what Boolean logic means. So you have to have simple you know, searching tools. And uh, uh, so you have to gear the whole design to 
the knowledge and skill level of the people and how they do things in their daily life to make it a good alignment and a good match. Mm -hmm. And Dick says, you're doing cognitive task analysis. I said, what is that? What, 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 what? <laughs> you know, he, says, yeah. he says, I'm doing it in medicine and we're doing it over Keck and you're doing it. And I said, by golly, we are, tell me more. So literally that's where I started learning the formality about CTA. Mm -hmm. uh, with Dick and working with him now at the Center for Cognitive Technology, doing um, the research in the medical area on CTA, uh, improving performance of surgeons through CTA-based instruction. And we did a whole series of studies that both demonstrated that experts do indeed omit up to 70%, what Dick calls the 70% rule, do indeed omit up to 70% of the critical information that people need to replicate that expertise, that novices need to replicate the expertise. And you can begin to fill in that 70% gap, if you will, by cognitive task analysis. But cognitive task analysis, Dick and I have done some studies on the efficiency of it, is expensive and time consuming. We've tried to train people on it students and things um, who have done dissertations on it. And it takes them, you know, a good uh, six months to become good enough to do a, a study on, for their dissertation on conducting CTA. But that's where Dix and I converging um, uh, met in. I was doing it on the usability of everyday people who were not necessarily experts, but they were using it every day. His was eliciting expertise from experts. Mm -hmm. And, but we have very similar methodologies of asking people, which Dick then has had already begun to formalize into a interview protocol system that he has and um, uh, that we've been working with ever since. Where we're, and the whole idea of CTA is, um, and I can give you the long history of, of it dating back into the early 20th century behavioral time and motion studies, mm -hmm. but basically as our modern work evolved is that we do more work in our minds now than we do with our hands and our bodies if you will so most of our work so therefore we just can't observe people and what they're doing we have to ask them yeah. what they're thinking and what analysis they're making and what decisions they're making well what we know about cognitive sciences is that the data, the information that we use on a daily basis over and over again gets automated and becomes less, less available to us in our consciousness. So we have to have these techniques of pulling that data, eliciting that knowledge and skills and performing complex uh, procedures or solving difficult problems, eliciting that from experts and creating this protocol. If this condition exists, do this, but if that condition exists, then do the other thing, you know, and it's the decisions that people make and the experts make and very rapidly and make these decisions that makes them experts, but it's so difficult for them to teach others because they omit all of those automated knowledge components that this primarily the decisions that they're making. So if we can elicit that from experts, then we can improve performance, human performance training by basing that training on expertise rather than on anecdotal or just experience and people who may well be experts, but they can't explain their expertise to others. Um, and so the whole CTA has become something of, of a passion with both Dick and I. And as I work more with the chariot project in the wearables and machine learning, the more I became aware of all the different artificial intelligence capabilities that have existed for decades, by the way, way right back in the 70s, they were doing artificial intelligence, but who can now can be put together because our computing power has increased so much. These artificial intelligence, different techniques can be put together in unique ways. And so I started thinking about how can we take this CTA of CTAs of the knowledge elicitation process that Dick and I do. So I do a CTA. Dick, how will you think about this? Dick, how do I think about it? And I'm trying to now translate that into artificial intelligence, trying to replicate what we do in our own minds when we're conducting a CTA interview. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. When do you stop and say, hey, wait a minute, are you making a decision here? Is there another way you could have done that? I noticed you hesitated. The things that we see by body language and what the triggers that, that experts tell us make us pause and explore deeply with probing questions. Well, my question is, can we achieve that using artificial intelligence and virtual agents? And that's the question I'm trying to answer with my research. And I think that's fascinating. So you're using CTA on CTA. <laughs> you can program artificial intelligence to conduct CTA. Right? <laughs> exactly. In a fashion that is scalable and content agnostic. Mm-hmm. So that's the, I have certain criteria that our wonderful uh, uh, researchers are, are working with that, that you can't build something that you can't scale quote unquote infinitely. And you can't, it can't be something that requires, uh, has to be accessible. So it has to be accessible to anywhere in the world, somebody with internet connectivity. It has to be scalable to any, to any content or domain area. And so it can't be hardwired, in other words. We have to build a neutral engine that you can go in and say, hi, guy, what would you like to tell me how to do today? And you're going to say, well, I would like to tell you how to produce a television show. Okay, great. You would like to tell me how to produce a television show. Tell me what the main steps are, okay, of doing that. And then we'll use the main steps to go deeper into the action and decisions you make. And producing the television show, you know, so it's uh, that's the idea that can be used for any content anywhere. Which then, as you can imagine, if you drink the Kool Aid of the vision of a content neutral system to capture expertise from anybody anywhere in the world, we've now revolutionized a whole lot of things. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, I it has huge implications for. Um, creating standardized processes, uh, nuanced processes, um, uh, make, you know, so I, I always think that, you know, people do formal training, formal instruction, but then people go back out to the job and they're, they're given some of it, most of it, perhaps, I don't know, but, but then there's all this informal learning that they have to do trial and error on nuanced steps, on on variations from what they've learned, you know, the context changes or some part of the context changes, and they have to figure that out. Um, and so this should reduce that having to figure things out informally, you can probably give them informally, whether it's things that you demand, expect them to memorize, or whether it's things that they can certainly reference, because you're always dealing with the memory thing. But what I, I wanted to follow up with you on this so the 70%, so experts can can miss up to 70% of what a novice needs is, is how Dick has phrased it to me in the past. And uh, I think this has huge implications. And we, we as a field in instructional systems design or instructional design or learning experience design, and we have all these competing overlapping uh, concepts and, and sure. tools for these things, but, but this has major implications to the analyst role to the designer role to the developer role if i if i can segment the isd or idea into wearing these different hats even the people that do the project planning and management have to understand a little bit about this so they can plan an adequate uh, cycle time and steps within that cycle time to allow people to to do to get to the nitty gritty the the to complete the you know, take it from the missing 70% and reducing that. Now, Dick told me that that through CTA, you can get about 85% of what a novice needs. And then and then it's, you know, trial and error and doing continuous improvement to your content after that. Um, but so what, what, what do you teach your students in your ISD program about the implications and how to deal with that when you're doing analysis, when you're doing design, when you're doing development? Well, it's, it's a critical part of uh, the instructional design classes and a critical part of the instructional design program uh, we have at Ross here called the, um, um, the, the uh, LDT program, Learning Design and Technology Program. It's a master's program at, at, at Ross here. Uh, and so that is uh, 
uh, in that program and in the individual instructional design classes, we teach cognitive task analysis. Okay. Uh, the, with uh, starting out with uh, the point is, is that if you don't have a clear way of getting somewhere, you know, and you know exactly what the steps are from the experts in the field, then you're gonna be creating curriculum that's less than effective. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, upfront analysis is one of the first things to go when you're, when you're uh, in the process of instructional design uh, in the needs assessment component of it. It's first thing, it's a, we, that's where the skimping of the things come in and that's the most important part. Right. And it's probably gonna take you longer, but you know, we have ways of showing you that if you spend time in the analysis, the actual instructional design is literally a very, very short phase in the program. And we have demonstrated this time again, where uh, we've done workshops where we'll do a CTA on a topic. And yes, that's taken up 75, 80% of the time is doing the analysis. And then they say, well, we came here to learn instructional design. Oh, okay, well, let's put a slide up there and see all these components you just did in the CTA. Here's the concomitant or here's where they belong in your instructional design. So now let's put them in there. It's take 10 minutes, copy and paste them into there. That's your instructional design. And they go, oh my goodness. It's what an aha moment, a revelation that in fact, good design is find out what they know, teach them what they need to understand then demonstrate what you want them to do and give them practice and feedback. <laughs> you know, these are elements that you're co collecting in the CTA process that, that align with the instructional design. So the, uh, for, for us and for me personally, um, it's, it's a, um, uh, it's a lift to teach CTA <clears throat> and we have to do certain accommodations to students such as, you know, first start with what the major steps are in a task um, and, uh, it, and try to get those to start with as an organizing or frame to dig deeper, okay? But we have to teach them how to do that. And uh, then we teach them, so, okay, now look at these steps, um, these major steps to do something, whether using you humorously to how to produce a TV show or <clears throat> how do you uh, how do you uh, plant a garden? There's major steps, you know, and most people think we just go out and start digging. No, you have to decide what you want to grow first. Okay, <laughs> so <clears throat> excuse me. Time for a drink right. of water. So I teach students to go and do some bootstrapping on how to find the the ten or so major steps. And actually, thanks to artificial intelligence, once again, this time embedded in Google and other search engines, you know, ask.com, Wolfram's Alpha, and all kinds of other wonderful um, um, search engines over through the web, you can actually just ask the question, how do you plant a garden? And it's gonna come back and tell you a whole page worth of interesting information. And which you can then use to bootstrap what we call bootstrapping the CTA and say, oh, now I have a general idea of how to do this. Now let me go ask my expert, how do you plant a garden? First, tell me the big major steps of it. And you have some comparison of what you know from uh, some frame of reference in the internet. And that's the first thing we teach them is how to get the, the main steps. And then, I, then we have to teach them the difficult part as you can recognize, which is let's take one of those steps. Tell me how you do that step. What's the first thing you do? And you know that's where you have to stop. It's you have active listening, stop and say, this is what I hear. By the way, are you deciding between two things here or are there alternative ways to do that? And that's where you start to elicit decision makings and judgments in those steps. And that's difficult to do. We've, um, I've recorded videos on it and we have procedures that we've demonstrated on how to go about doing this. But we require our students to go through this at least for one of the lessons in an academic environment. So they've had the experience of taking a lesson, doing a detailed CTA on that task, that subtask, if you will, of the major tasks, and then develop a complete lesson from that based on CTA all the way through 
to all the summative um, and formative assessments during that lesson. Um, and we also uh, take those big major steps uh, and we actually, before we start the detailed steps is we say, how would you organize your curriculum? Um, do people need to follow these steps in order? If the answer is yes, then you better teach it in order. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, is it a big step or a small step? Can you combine steps into one lesson? How long are your lessons going to be? Is it in person or asynchronous or, you know, et cetera? All these questions that you have to have some direction on. Or do you need to pull a step apart because you've got too many, you know, this is a big step. There's lots of decisions in here you have to make. So maybe it needs to be two lessons. So they work through this thought process of trying to create um, curriculum that's actually doable in the real world that you can implement in the real world. And of course we do, which I haven't mentioned is one of my, uh, you know, I do use the Kirkpatrick New World four, four level. It's always been a favorite of evaluation, but since the New World 2016 book came out with uh, Jim and Wendy Kirkpatrick building on Don's work, uh, that has been my, my go-to for evaluation only because of one major, major reason for that. And that is their level three is becomes the most important part. If you can't measure people doing things which you have taught them today, doing things in their work this week and next week and the week after on the job, then you haven't succeeded. Something is wrong in your instructional design system. You know, so something's wrong in your whole performance improvement system if they, you cannot measure it as you go along. So Kirkpatrick is a very important part. So we do require as critical elements of our instructional design classes that we are teach them cognitive task analysis, teach them a needs assessment in general. And in a sense that is grounded in human performance technology because we wanna find out by the way, is this really a learning problem or do you have a motivation problem? And how do you build motivation into instructional design and create the environment so that the organization and the and the uh, the the culture of the organization the resources are there to succeed so really what we're teaching is human performance as a needs assessment and then cta for the instructional design and kirkpatrick at the end for the evaluation as we go wow that was a long-winded answer well, but that's that but thank you for all of that no i really appreciate that you you mentioned that you have some videos, and I was going to ask: Is there a textbook that you're using when you're teaching ATA, or are there articles that you give the students, or is this all proprietary? You know, Ken Yates and and University of Southern California content. How can the rest of the world access this to learn more about it, and even more importantly, learn how to do it? Well, to get an overview, uh, there is a book chapter that I participated in with uh, Dick and uh, Jerome Van Morenberg, Dave Felden, and, and myself, and, and the book chapter uh, on simply called Cognitive Task Analysis. And that book chapter probably can be found on your HBT Treasure site. Okay. In Dick, in Dick Clark's uh, uh, page. I, I do believe it is there. <laughs> All right. And that's going to give you a, oh, not only an overview of CTA, very, very good overview, if I don't say so myself, but also of the major instructional design systems, including Van Morenberg's 4CID, that interface with the product of CTA very, very nicely. And um, so um, uh, that publication is a book chapter, actually. Um, that is the go-to source. It's the fundamental reading in our classes for mm -hmm. instructional design um, and CTA. And then I've recorded demonstrations at CTA and videos that are on YouTube. And um, I believe they're on my YouTube channel, which I will send you a link to. And, um, uh, and I have videos on YouTube that I've recorded for classes, but they're available publicly both on CTA and demonstrations of it and uh, on human performance technology as well, Sorry. including Excellent. a full work demonstration of how to conduct a gap analysis study, so. Very good. Well, I will include the, the URLs for all of this in the show notes for this particular video. And so we will have the, uh, the article that uh, the chapter that you guys wrote 
and then your YouTube channel so that uh, people can follow up on this. Because I think this is critically important. Um, um, you know, Dick has mentioned to me that uh, uh, I think the number is 80% of people who do, do delivery and instructor led training are experts and they've been given the charge to develop and to deliver their content. And so, of course, they're missing up to 70%. And I, you know, so when we say the, the phrase, it sounds, I, I always call these weasel words, but up to 70% means it's not always at 70%. Yeah. What's, the, what's the average range for what is typically missing here? If it could be up to 70%, what's, what's the low end of that? Well, uh, what might be interesting is the CTAs that I've studied that I have done with uh, my students for the dissertations and doctoral mm -hmm. students um, have been both, well, let's take the K-12 area. So uh, how, to, how, to, um, uh, how to solve quadratic equations using factoring uh, or how to divide fractions by fractions, uh, how to teach uh, expository writing, um, things like that, uh, how, to conduct, um, how to conduct informal teacher walkthroughs, you know, giving teachers feedback as they're teaching by other teachers and by the school leadership. Um, how to teach pedagogy that incorporates culturally relevant, um, uh, culturally relevant issues into the pedagogy. In other words, re reaching students no matter what age, but especially K-12, and especially students who have might previously been underserved and, and whose teachers may not really understand the culture that, that they um, come from, if you will, on a daily basis and meeting them where that culture is for them. In other words, my old adage that I learned as a very, very young school teacher was, you know, pick up on Monday morning where your students left off on Sunday night. So you want to be tapping into where your students are. This culturally relevant pedagogy is something that it's uh, definitely been de demonstrated that if you are learning based upon things that your, your lived experiences, your prior knowledge, and you're connecting it with new knowledge, that's going to has a higher potential of being encoded and retained in long-term memory. So this um, CTAs on culturally relevant pedagogy are extensive. One of my students is over 200 steps <laughs> to do that, but it's thorough. So the students who did this, they also did compared each one of the experts with the other experts' knowledge. And that's where the percentage, they range widely, of course, but it ranges yeah. anywhere from in the 50s, mid 50s to the upper 60s. Um, so but that's I would still say significant to miss half, that, half or more, uh, up to seventy percent. That's always it's that should least. be red lights should be flashing in the entire world of instructional design. That that when you rely on one subject matter expert, which I think is too prevalent a practice, when you rely on that one, and they're telling you what to what to put in it and whatnot, and and you go along happily thinking that you're doing a good job because you made them happy. Well, you're leaving a lot off, you, you know, a lot on the table, off the table, whatever the right yeah, thing right. is. But, but, but the student, the learners who are performers, they're going to go back to the job and they're going to be armed with maybe half, maybe less than half of what they need in order to perform, which leaves a lot of informal social learning that needs to happen, which ultimately can be effective, but it's not very efficient. Well, not only is it not very efficient, but it's also what the teacher, instructor, any grade level, what you wish, or even mm -hmm. professional development or, or training and organiz business organizations, what they do then is they tend to fill in their lack of knowledge with their own anecdotal experience, which may be inaccurate. It worked for them, but that doesn't mean it's worked for everybody. So... Yeah. You know, by aggregating expertise, you are reducing the potential of the the one time it worked for me. I'm going to teach you how to do that. All right, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. no good. That's not a good idea. So, this is what happens. We fill it in with our own knowledge, and when we, furthermore, when we call upon experts to design curriculum, and or training, etc., most of the time, uh, they will tend to default to the way they were taught. 
So if you've got the, if you were taught, let's use my world of the university, if you were taught by the university professor who was in turn taught by his or her university professor <laughs> and taught for turn, then all you're doing is taking that way of teaching, which means you could trace like a good etymology of a word. You can keep tracing this design of this instruction back to where all you did was attend lectures. Okay. And there's no engagement going on with the learner sort of thing. And there's no teaching people how to do things or teaching them what to do and saying what to do in lectures. So we tend to teach the way that we're taught. And this is where, again, cognitive task analysis can, can begin to say, yes, but what do you want them to be able to do? Okay, yeah. well, we want to be able to do this. We're telling them all the things they need to know. Yeah, except how to do it. And what do you want? To, you know? Well, they should learn how to do that. Well, if we can elicit expertise, then we can be, our content can be much more reliable that we're going to be teaching them how to do something well that experts do. So. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you. I do, I do get on my soapbox. I oh, I, I'm, I'm so glad you did. I, I very much appreciated that. That's exactly what I wanted from this interview, Ken. So don't feel bad about that. Don't ask the professor fact, anything. You'll, you'll but, go with the drop in the lecture mode. <laughs> well, of course, of course. But uh, so I, before I shift to my next question, um, I just want to give you an opportunity to fill in anything that may, we may have missed because we've talked about uh, you know, wearables, and we've talked about cognitive task analysis. And, uh, you know, for people entering the profession, whether they're going to be into instructional design, or whether they're going after, you know, broader performance improvement, you know, beyond instruction, but including instruction, what else, what else are you working on in, in, in your program and in your teaching and in your research that we that we can, you know, bring to the fore here? Well, there is one other thing which is kind of um, uh, <laughs> always ends up in in my classes when in one form or another, and and that is is that uh, and yes, let me just reflect a little bit of, of where I come from a little. Sure, okay, please. Um, I think one thing that I could say about myself is that along my long career, um, you know. Working up towards the white hair stage, et cetera. There's one thing that I think has always kept me going that now I recognize is that along the way, every new business, every new opportunity I had to explore as an entrepreneur, or because I was asked to get into and learn about something, or if I was curious because so many you know, things like artificial intelligence or machine learning or going all the way back to using media and how you use media. There's two things. One is bringing out the best in people. Everything you do, bringing out the best in people, always focusing on people's assets, number one. And number two for yourself is I realized that I somewhere along the line learned how to learn. I was ultimately very, very curious about things. I think I picked that up from my father at a young age because he was a scientist and not only was he a scientist, he was very, very focused. Uh, we didn't know what he did because it was all secret work, but it was very focused and he persisted. When other people gave up and they literally wanted him to stop, he said, no, I can do this. Just give me some engineers and I can do this. And by golly, he did do it. And then he retired, but he did it. So I think I learned curiosity from him and persistence and doggedness to keep learning and learning something new, find out more information. And somewhere along the line, that's one of the things that I learned how to do was learning how to learn. So what's interesting, Guy, is I ask in my classes, everybody, all the students who actually were, ta were taught how to learn, taught learning strategies to self-teach yourself what questions to ask, how to, how to do, go and find out new information that you need in order to solve problems. How many people are actually taught how to learn? And not a hand goes up. And it said, how many of you who are in K-12 actually have incorporate this into your teaching where you're teaching people how to learn? And they all go, we don't do that. Some new progressive schools now are beginning to raise their hands, granted. Mm -hmm. But for the far majority of, of my students, 
I say, we don't teach that. And yet, when we look at the evidence and look at the literature, we see what's one of the characteristics of expertise? Experts, experts in any field are highly metacognitive. They're always monitoring where they are and adjusting what they need to know or adjusting their actions, evaluating whether it worked and re-setting new goals. I mean, it's highly, highly reflective, meta, building metacognitive knowledge, and they know how to teach themselves, highly self-regulatory, okay? And we don't really teach that, yet it's the number one thing that we should be teaching, if anything, in all of school starting in, in kindergarten, if you will. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's teaching people how to learn. And so what's recently um, is my desire, and some of my students who have now graduated as doctorates say, let's create a, um, an instrument and let's create an instrument that we can actually give to people that can, they can do an assessment of with their learning strategies and their monitoring of their children's learning strategies, which becomes all more important in a pandemic because all our children are home learning from yeah. home and don't have the benefit of having a classroom teacher, et cetera. So the parent-teacher-student partnership has to, is more and more important. And so this is a, a more recent thing that I've been working on that um, is learning how to learn, but people coming in to this profession, instructional design, who want to become human performance technologists, if you will, instructional designers who are, are, are trainers of whether it's K-12 or whether it's business and industry, anybody's in this business is number one is, is become an expert on learning how to learn new things and be real curious <laughs> if you can develop curiosity because it's within the curiosity and uh, that you can acknowledge your ignorance and it's your ignorance that then should propel you to go and find that information to learn how to learn. And then the second thing is, is something I ask all my students to do, is that these days, everybody has an opinion about everything. So if you ever are talking to someone about anything having to do with human performance, educational psychology, academic achievement, pedagogy, training, anything in this whole world, and they start saying this, this, and this works, this is what the works. You ask him one question. Show me your evidence. Show me your evidence. So yes. I, I drum that into students that you can't have conversations based upon opinion, that you need to have and must have conversations based upon the evidence, the learning science evidence, the evidence in the literature that in fact, these things work or else they have at least, it may not be beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt in our philosophical terms, but it's at least preponderance of the evidence that it works, right? And it works in the context that you are um, um, addressing. What, what, one thing that principle that you may work in of this principle may work in you know, higher education or it may work in business of a, um, uh, of a population that may have been underserved because now they come to you with not only a different culture, but they come to you with different prior knowledge, different expectations. And the things you're talking about, they may not even know what it means, constructs, you know, what it means. So you have to know who your learners are and adapt to them. So anyway, that's a long-winded story about basing things on evidence for sure. Yeah, I, uh, I rem I've talked with uh, uh, Dale Brethauer, who is a professor emeritus from uh, Western Michigan University, because I remember him talking about learning to learn back in the 80s and early 90s. And there's a exactly. professor there, and I can't remember her name, who had picked that up, but I thought he was involved in it, but he, he was giving credit to other people up there. But uh, is there a particular reference that you would point our audience to if they want to learn more about the, the specifics, the strategies and tactics of learning how to learn? What reference do you give your students? Well, in, in, uh, there, are, there are certainly books out on self-regulation and learning strategies. And um, uh, uh, there is a book, um, 
out that's used in our uh, higher education that's um, by uh, Helena Sully uh, and Myron Dembo. And um, it's uh, strategies for college success, I believe it's called or something like that. Okay. And they have many good self-regulation strategies in them. Um, the uh, mayor has written, uh, Richard Mayer has written extensively and has some instruments about um, uh, strategies for learning, how to read texts, looking for, you know, learn how to realize that what you're being shown in a title and subtitles in a book chapter or an article actually are there for a purpose, folks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're there to prime you to what's coming, but also turn it into a question. Now, what do I know about the subtitle? <laughs> Insert subtitle and see if you can answer it in your own words. And so these strategies, we just don't teach. But Mayor had some wonderful strategies like that. Um, and actually, uh, Dick and I have, uh, worked on a product that uh, we were um, uh, in cooperation with um, in military training about taking uh, Merrill's um, uh, knowledge types, you know, and concepts, processes, and principles, uh -huh. and procedures, and combining it with some of the strategies of Mayor. And we actually created a, a, a document that um, uh, one of these days we really should commercialize called Learning to Learn. You know, and it's basically saying, okay, what's the objective that I'm being asked here? And how is the uh, teacher, instructor, professor, trainer going to assess me on this? And then what concepts and terms do I need to know? You know, and am I going to be asked on how things work, process and mayor, Richard Mayer's terminology? And so you're asking yourself these questions. Keep questioning yourself. What is it that I need to know? And then do I know that? Or do I need to go find the answer to that? Or I need to go seek help from the professor saying, by the way, what's the objective of what we're doing? You know, as simple as that. Or how am I going to be assessed? How are we going to be assessed on these things? So you know um, that. But these strategies um, of learning how to learn, there are uh, some of those resources and Again, once again, I encourage, always encourage my students and any professional to Google it, you know, how to learn, how to learn, or what are learning strategies. You, uh, I have a technique where I tell my students, you must set a timer, you must set a timer of five minutes and you searching regular Google. And then if you like using different keywords, if you like what you see in regular Google, you stop, you must stop, go to Google Scholar and put the same keywords that work for you and you can do that for five minutes okay mm -hmm. and you should have everything you need to know both from uh, evidence-based scholarly works and from the uh non-peer review or more popular you know publications so uh I, I try to teach students do a little research you know yes don't yes. just go to wikipedia wikipedia is a good source good to for i call often first the site s-i-g-h-t and mm -hmm. last to cite C-I-T-E, but you may, you know, but certainly Google's artificial intelligence is really outstanding these days and the, how it's progressed. But you also have to understand how Google's al algorithms work to see what built-in biases Google may have that are being revealed as well. So it's, you have to be a very literate information um, retrieval person, if you will. That, that is, yeah, that's as important as learning to learn, uh, learning to search. So in the search, absolutely, yes. Well, thank you for, seriously, for all of that. I very much appreciate that. Um, let me shift gears here. Uh, you've kind of talked a little bit about this, but uh, you know, as a lifelong learner, I was asking where your current or next focus is, and are you working on anything that you're writing about uh, now or just come out with or something soon? What, what can you share with us about what's next? Well, um, I, what really we're focusing on is um, I am having to go and learn as much as I can from my perspective and prior knowledge, which is weak in artificial intelligence, machine learning. So I have um, I spend um, a good deal of my time uh, trying to educate myself in this area. Um, and so I can basically come up with ideas 
that uh, the more experienced computer scientists that we work for, researchers that we work for can suit down and say, no, that doesn't work, that doesn't apply here, but you never can tell. So I'm constantly working on that. And then we're, we're obviously, we want to uh, take our research and memorialize it into reports and articles about what we find and how we went about doing it and what its conclusions are, what's the challenges for the next gen, you know, of trying to use artificial intelligence in uh, educational settings, if you will, since uh, uh, I'm, I'm with the university in that area, we're very interested in how to personalize learning for all learners, especially addressing issues of equity and inclusion and how we can use technology to do that. It's very important for us at Rossier School of Education. It's part of our mission. So uh, that's something that we uh, often think about in more traditional terms of education. But I'm I like to focus in on well, how can technology do this, you know? And technology does a lot of things that we have taken for granted. Um, you know, the great example I've seen on the internet lectures is the cabbies in London used to be indispensable, and that was why was that was because they had to pass rigorous tests on every street in London, right? But what's happened to the cabbie is, is that GPS has replaced that portion of the cabbie's work. So I always have to ask myself, what, what part of the teaching process in K-12 higher education, what part are we vulnerable to in education to be replaced by technology and what parts are actually opportunities for us in technology that free us up to do the most important things of education, yes. which I would consider to be right up there at the top, which is making connections with our students on social emotional levels that motivate them to pursue their dreams and to pursue their goals. Again, bringing out the assets and everybody to achieve their highest. So for me, I think a lot about how can technology do that. Now that could be threatening to some educators. Other right. educators would see it as, yes, we should, be, we should be focusing on that portion. If I can get this to help me do the other part, mm -hmm. then we should be doing that. And that is weighing those moral ethical issues of equity and inclusion. Um, and diversity and dealing with diversity through personalized learning, bring everybody up to be able to see the ball game over the fence, you know, a vehicle yeah. that by building up those, the prior knowledge, confidence and motivation to do that. That's an, how can I do that using technology, using advanced technology and being a little bit over the horizon? Yes, but that's what I think about a lot. And, um, uh, and there are ways of doing that. Um, there are pieces out there that show promise doing that, just putting them together and having the opportunity to try it. It's like the wearables that we started out with, having the opportunity to try it in the classroom or amongst learners. Um, artificial intelligence being used to capture expertise. You know, we've got a little demo up now and I will send it on to you, the demo, the link to the demo but it's very fundamental and it only captures actions, decisions, but the next 2.0, if you will, is decision statements. But if we can get that to show even greater usability and promise, then we can start collecting expertise from a hundred different people concurrently. It's only computing power, you know, so that limits us. These are things that obviously you can tell excite me and the things that I think about and as we do more and more research on it that we want to write about to let others know about. So, excellent. Well, thank you again for that. That's uh, very exciting, and the 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 future looks sunny, looks bright. <laughs> well, let me shift gears here again. Here uh, we're getting uh, not not quite to the end, but we're getting closer. Um, my question is about our language and terminology, and so it's about: is there a favorite or a <laughs> A, a phrase or term within the world of performance improvement or education or instruction that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you'd like to put your spin on it. But, uh, you know, and if you have more than one term or phrase, you know, I'm fine, you know, taking more than one, but uh, what, what do you have for us? 
Well, I, I think that the, the term has to be, in, especially in my environment where I work for a school of education, the university, uh, uh, my term has got to be the, the term gap analysis. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I tell Dick, uh, I, I, wish we, I wish we could have eliminated that somewhere along the line, but it's, you know, it, times change. In the environment changes, the culture changes. Mm -hmm. What's current now was not current back in 2008 when Rick Dick wrote the, the latest version of that um, book um, and republished it. Uh, and uh, now we kind of see, okay, it's gap analysis is people say it's a deficit model. You talk about a gap, a gap. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, so I'm trying to switch out of gap analysis to human performance technology, HPT. Mm -hmm. We're improving human performance. Do, is there room for improvement in human performance? Uh, you ask yourself that question. Yes, okay. Do we need to do something new? Is a new policy, a new this or a new that, that we need to um, um, improve our skills to be able to perform? Then that's the answer, sure. Um, so I wanna, I wanna try to, I have to constantly explain that gap, gap, although it sounds like a deficit term, okay, it really is just a measurement between A and B, you know, point A and point B. And that's um, in the popular uh, culture of today, um, we're trying to build education on asset models rather than deficit models, okay? It's not what students don't know, it's what do students know that we can build upon. It's not classroom management. It's developing a classroom culture that is optimal to learning rather than trying to manage students, if you will. So in education, we're more towards the asset-based model. So I would love to find an asset word that substitutes for gap analysis. Although, again, if you Google gap analysis, you're going to come up with 10 million or more and it's used mostly in accounting and in industry. Uh, we're not producing enough widgets. We have a gap of this in our production line. We have a shortfall of our revenue. And in education, you know, it, it probably was easier when we had a weren't hitting our standardized testing remarks, and that influenced our funding from the federal government. We had a gap in funding. Okay, fine. But now it's. I wish I had a different word that I could use instead of gap analysis. Yeah. Um, because it triggers things for educators mm -hmm. and you have to try to explain when is something that you want to do to go from A to B, achieve this goal, whereas here's where you're at now, what can we call that? And I just call it human performance improvement. So mm -hmm. that's, I'm trying to get away from it. I do have to literally, when students graduate, I might say this, when students either graduate or they're about to do their dissertation studies in HPT, uh, in which they're gonna collect data in the framework of do people know, are they, what motivates them, et cetera, the, the KMO framework and from the Clark and that season. Mm -hmm. I, if we're gonna go at a site and do this, I have to teach them how to talk like consultants and not like educators. So I said, okay, before you go into this meeting, let's talk about the language we use. You're not going to go in there and tell them what problems do they have. Ask them what challenges or areas of growth do they want to see at their school. Don't tell them they have a gap. Just tell them where would they like to improve their organization's, you know, performance in a certain area. So I literally, I say, you can't make people feel bad because they've got problem, problem, problem. You have to make them feel good about what they have and how can we build on it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I have to literally start teaching my students the jargon of consultancy, as opposed to the jargon of what they've been learning in class, if you will. Yeah. And that's a shift, but that's where it begins, you know, and um, uh, to try to get into the model of building on people's assets, which is something that it's, it's important, obviously, and it's critical. It's um, and not give people the wrong impression. So to speak. I know the, the language has been an issue. I remember the late Don Toasty talking about, you know, he was tired that we, we position ourselves as, as if we're in the repair business, 
And where we do that, yes, but that we can't just be the repair people, the repairmen, the repair women. Um, so I think, and then this was about the time that appreciative inquiry was coming about. And so we weren't being in a problem centered. We were going to be uh, uh, improvement uh, 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 centered. And I, I, when I talk to people about this, I said, you know, we can, we can address problems. We can address opportunities flip sides of the same coin, so to speak. But there's also an opportunity when it's greenfield, when there's nothing there and you can use the, 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 the concepts and the models and the tools and the techniques of human performance technology to tackle something that doesn't exist, but building something from scratch from ground zero. So there's almost three contexts when we're dealing with a, a, an existing problem or, hey, we're doing just fine. How do we do even better? because maybe we've compared ourselves to the uh, competition and where we're doing just fine, we're at parity with the competition and we need to do even better in certain areas. Not that we've got a problem. And again, that, that, that taints what we're doing when we cast it uh, in a negative sense that way. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And it's because of that, exactly what you're saying, right? It's because of that, that I've taken the so-called, if you will, the traditional improvement model, okay? And um, I, I've had some students to say, well, it, what, I'm, what I wanna do with my organization, my site, whether it be a school or some business or whatever, is they wanna do something new. I said, aha, okay, what you're talking about then is an improve, I mean, a innovation model. And I said, so where are they now? Well, we're zero, we don't have this thing. We need to have a new, we need to get create a new dashboard uh, for you know reporting to our shareholders and our thing. And I said, so you or customer satisfaction, a brand new dashboard of that. I said, great. Where are you at on that? We're zero. I said, where do you want to be? We need the dashboard. That's hundred percent. Great. What do you need to know? And so you ask them these questions. All of a sudden, yeah. you realize if your goal is a dashboard, you don't have one now. Here's what you now can ask yourself these questions. So we've adapted it to innovation. We've adapted it to evaluation. So we've got a program going, great. What do you think? Well, nobody knows how it's doing. Well, first of all, ask yourself number one question, what's the goal of the program? And are you achieving that goal? Okay. Now, once you've established that, <laughs> your second question is, what are the things that people need to know, motivate and the KMO framework mm -hmm. apply to that? And where are they succeeding and where are they need some improvement to, um, to, to reach that goal. And now all of a sudden we have an evaluation model. So innovation, you know, evaluation, but it's all the simple and elegant framework of take your problem. If the problem were solved, what goal would you achieve? What would be achieved if that problem doesn't exist? Okay, where are you with that goal? Okay, and now, What's the KMO? What's the knowledge, motivation, organizational factors for that goal? And the more the students come back to me in any context and say it works, the more I am encouraged to keep teaching it. Yes, no, exactly. Well, let me shift gears here again uh, one more time. Um, what I wanna do is, again, this is for our audience so that they may wanna follow up with, with people in particular here, but so in the, in the more recent years, maybe the last decade or so, who are some of the people that have influenced you and, and what did you learn from them? And perhaps that will trigger an interest in, in some of our viewers and they may wanna follow up with that, with that individual. But so who would you call out and say, you know, uh, these are people here that, that have had a major impact on me mostly for positive reasons. Um, uh, but, but so who would you point people to and, and, and what, what might they want to focus on uh, getting from that individual? Well, obviously I think the, uh, the in more recent uh, 15, 20 years has been Dick Clark's and, and is certainly uh, a major influencer for me. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and Dick has, Dick's work is, is well documented, and his books are well documented. Uh, the uh, classic turning research into results, if we can call it a classic at this point, uh, mm -hmm. is, is accessible, simple to absorb, uh, and um, 
there, if you're looking for an, a book that overlays a K-12 um, you know, school environment or overlay to the gap analysis, Clark and Estes turning research into results, then Robert Rueda's book is in K-12 area called Three Dimensions. Um, that book is, again, a, it's, I, I, I recall when Robert did it, he basically took a sabbatical and he says he's going to take the business oriented turning research and overlay the education oriented. So it, it presents all kinds of, of insights of how you apply the um, human performance technology, the gap analysis into K-12. And that's an excellent book for the K-12 viewers that you um, have and people are interested. Um, so, uh, you know, I think those, uh, those are the books that are immediate, um, uh, certainly are the immediate influencers in terms of, of what I do. Um, you know, I think going, going back, uh, when I look back at my you know, previous uh, iterations of my life in various industries and various careers I've had, at each stage there were people who were um, uh, mentors or people I learned things from, good or bad, or who didn't know that they were mentors, some who knew they were. Sure. But, um, uh, and I definitely learned from those people um, uh, and built on the things that they knew and adapted it to my own style, personal, personal style, if you will, the things I learned. Uh, a lot of things about um, uh, that I learned in the entertainment industry applies to anybody in any field. When you think about some of how entertainers are managed, if you will, managed in terms of their career guidance is what I mean by managed, their career guidance. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how that works, I had insights into that. Um, and planning, working backwards, where do you see yourself in a year? What kind of entertainer do you want to be? And now what do we need to do to work backwards? Working backwards is important. And achieving those goals, that applies as an entertainment I saw time and time again. It applies in creating, um, you know, I worked in television with starting television networks, producing shows for big television networks, the main ones, et cetera. And always it starts with an idea and that idea has to turn into a vision or that you can execute, but then it's all planning and working backwards to execute that idea and bringing all these people with incredible amounts of talent, as you know, incredible amounts of talent to optimize that talent towards a single purpose. All of that I learned from um, from the entertainment world, from my projects, entrepreneurism, you know, respecting the vision, always putting the vision out in front. And um, I think one thing definitely I learned from, from being an entrepreneur, raising money, capital money to do things, is that you better own your vision and be able to communicate your vision well to others. And then along the way, be willing to uh, adapt to what others' needs are to create that vision. And don't try to fight the other vision that someone else has, try to find the vision that you both share and incorporate that. So those are along the way I've learned from either mentors or people who uh, weren't necessarily a formal mentor, but just working with them, the takeaways that I had from them sort of thing. But, um, uh, I, you know, recently, I think going back to, um, to Clark's, you can't go wrong in terms of reading the, the Clark's work, certainly in media, you know, in education, we've shown that technology doesn't matter. We've had 10 years of working with popularity of technology. What matters is the underlying methods and what matters is aligning those methods with the cognitive processes of learning and those that matter. And if we can try to convince all the technology people with it, they are, in Clark's words, just delivery vehicles. Um, that would be very helpful. And it's a constant theme that I certainly teach and, and try to practice is that uh, the technology doesn't matter. What really matters is what the technology is delivering. You know, that matters. Instructional design matters. Okay, that's what matters. Engaging the learners matters. Their culture 
matters and where they are at every day matters. So I've been reading an awful lot about that and the equity and inclusion and people in that space. I've even been reading, it's becoming more aware these days, um, considering our current environment, becoming more aware of the, uh, even where some, uh, most of our educational psychology comes from is based and grounded in, in the sense in the researchers. And it, there's been some populations who haven't participated in that research. So in a sense, even our current research is a reflection of not a total picture of what our populations are. So there's digging to be done in diversity and inclusion of that. So I'm about to teach a class during the summer and I'm gonna basically give my students the charge of we're going to be exploring um, uh, educational psychology issues, current issues in learning based from a, a wide diverse range of researchers. Okay, not just the researchers that are tried and true that we've been using all along, but it's time for us to be able to peel back the layers and, re and reveal that we need to be inclusive in our research. And that's part of what I'm doing. So I'm doing a lot of reading in that area. Well, I'm going to sign you up right now to do another video with me, probably in about a year to, so that we can report out on what was learned by that. <laughs> What are the implications for that? Exactly. What what path forward does that suggest for us? Yes. So I have so uh, my final question for you um, has to do with uh, parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially for those who are new to the field of instructional design and and human performance technology. But um, you, and, and you deal with a lot of students here and, and people who are graduating, going out into the world. So, but, but, but for people who are brand new coming in, what would you tell to, uh, what's, what advice do you have for those people? <laughs> brand new into uh, it's, uh, instructional design. Yes. Uh, especially instructional design, let's uh, focus in on that. Um, I would say brand new instructional design is Never, never start designing based upon your first intuition. Conduct a thorough needs assessment, okay? In, which includes your getting input from your learners, your intended audience, no matter if it's K-12 students or in business or in industry or what. Go and ask, what is it that they need? What is it that they want to see in this particular area that you have been either charged with or what you're about to teach, your curriculum, your course, et cetera, or your training, is find out what their needs are and incorporate that into it. Number one, it's going to, uh, it's going to um, optimize your engagement by these people when they go and do it. They'll see their needs being reflected in your instruction. And number two is that your instruction will be grounded in what their needs are, which means it'll be more effective. And, and then be sure you overlay what the evidence has to say about it. Don't do things because you, know, you think it's just gonna please them. Learning is difficult. So be sure that you scaffold them and uh, on learning, but always start with that needs assessment of thoroughly who your learners are, not only in their prior knowledge, but also in their motivation areas, their confidence, okay? And then and their confidence in doing things what they are, hopefully they attribute their success to is their own efforts. And most importantly, know where they come from in their culture. So you can be using analogies, examples in your demonstrations that they can relate to, okay? So everything that falls into a needs analysis, including breaking down the task using cognitive task analysis is the number one um, piece of advice I have because often everybody, I've seen it in my students, they just jump to the curriculum, okay? Or they jump to an activity. Well, what's this activity going to do? You know, I wanna use this technology. Well, great, what are you trying to accomplish with this technology, you see? So this is the um, needs assessment is my number one. Always look up and be, literate in your research abilities to look up what the evidence is that's going to address your actual interventions in your instruction. And 
finally, always evaluate. Never leave out an evaluation. You want to know, yes, they might know something when you leave, but if you have been a wonderful instructor, that glow is just going to make them say, you're wonderful. I learned a lot. Don't ask. You can ask them when your course training curriculum is over, but more importantly, ask them weeks and months or years afterwards whether or not they are actually using it, whether or not they remember, whether or not they actually recall the knowledge that they learned and it didn't have an impact on their lives. So never leave out evaluation, never leave out evaluation at all levels of impact all the way down, if you're using Kirkpatrick, all the way down to their emotional or motivational you know, levels. So those are the things, everything in the middle is fun. Okay, if you did a good needs analysis, if you know you're going to evaluate and you've got your summative event all worked out, then everything in the middle is fun as long as you're true to the evidence. Okay. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Ken, <laughs> thanks for uh, sharing with us today in this uh, video interview. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of you spending the time with us here today. Thanks so much. Cheers. My pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.